The Great Dock Strike of 1889 was the culmination of a long struggle in the British labour movement that fought tirelessly for workers' rights, led to trade unions being legalised in 1871, and finally emerged as a mass movement that ushered in the era of widespread unionisation, known as New Unionism, that we see today. Colonel G. L. Burt, the general manager of the Millwall Docks, said that the poor fellows are miserably clad, scarcely with a boot on their foot, in a most miserable state. These are men who come to work in our docks, who come on without having a bit of food in their stomachs. Perhaps since the previous day, they have worked for an hour and have earned five pence. Their hunger will not allow them to continue. They take the five pence in order that they may get food, perhaps the first food they have had for 24 hours. Benjamin Tillett had already been involved in earlier efforts to unionise and in 1887 formed the Tea Operatives and General Labourers Association. The union struggled though, with membership varying unstably between 300 and 800 workers. The men on the docks were paid bonuses depending on the weight of their workloads. This was called the plus system and was used by the companies at the docks to pay the men unfairly, changing the rate per weight regularly and keeping the men competing for jobs. Ben Tillett wrote a letter to the company directors on behalf of the union about the PLUS system, but the letter was ignored and the union was deemed too weak to act. On the 3rd of August though, a meeting took place headed by a group of men determined to start a new union. Around 3,000 men were present at the meeting and Tillett was said to be furious at the intention to start a new union. But the speakers convinced the men of the need to strike, and by the 14th of August 1889, work at the South Dock had come to a halt. Ben Tillett's union flourished though, and the number of men on strike eventually grew to around 100,000. The strikers organised marches through the capital and picket lines at the gates of the companies. Practice was that the men had to line up at different times per day to get work, usually just a few hours work. This was to keep competition between the men high and drive down wage costs. The strikers demanded that workers would not be discharged without four hours work and that work would be given out to only two fixed periods per day. They also demanded that minimum wage be raised to six pence an hour. The biggest problem for the strikers though were the blacklegs, workers who continued to work while the strike went on. This is why picket lines became so important, so that workers were shamed, sometimes violently, into not working, or at least reminded that, as one striker said, it's because of you that our wives and kids are starving. The companies though held strong, not giving in to the strikers' demands, and although the marches attracted donations, the funds slowly dried up and morale started to drop. It was though through the fortune of a recent innovation that the strikers would eventually secure success. The telegraph was invented by Francis Ronalds in 1816, and by 1858 the first transatlantic telegraph had been laid, reducing the time it took to send a message from Britain to America from 10 days to almost instantly. So, while by the end of August the strikers' funds had almost entirely dried up, a surprising number of donations started to come in from sympathisers in Australia, where the newspapers had reported on the Great Strike after being kept up to date by The Telegraph. By the end of the strike, £37,273 had been donated from Australia, without which the dockers would have almost definitely failed. While the Australian donations were undoubtedly raised out of sympathy for the strikers, Historians have cited Australia's shifting disposition between allegiance to British Empire and to Australian nationhood as a motive for donating so much, while socialism, nationalism and imperialism were all central topics of 19th century political discourse. Donating to workers in Britain served to both maintain sympathy for the mother country, while simultaneously asserting superiority. The irony may be that the telegraph was laid specifically for business reasons, but without it, the massive uptrend in unionisation that was seen from the dock strike all the way to the 1980s, some 100 years later, 
may not have been quite what it was. If you like these videos and would like to support me making more, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook by clicking the links in the description below. You can like this video and subscribe to the Then and Now channel to see more. And if you're feeling really generous, you can pledge as little as a dollar towards the creation of each new video. You can click here to find out more. Thank you.